you're serious about your goals and the RP Diet app is here to help. It creates a diet for your specific needs, lets you choose your favorite foods, and tells you exactly how much of them to eat and when. Expert System AI guides you along to keep you on track to your goals. For less than $15 a month, you have one of the most powerful diet coaches in your pocket. Cutting edge data science tailored to your exact goals. The future is here today. And we're rolling. Folks, welcome back. We're in the, the wake of the RP Plus seminar, which, uh, which went great. <laughs> RP Plus seminar? Just I don't know the what RP the Plus. hell I'm talking about. The RP Summit. I didn't get either of those right. Um, and it was fantastic. We had a bunch of fun. I got to meet people I met through our old job at Temple. There was former students there. There were RP uh, clients of mine there. There were RP Plus people there. It was great. There was a ton of people. It was really fun. Yeah. It was a really good time. Can you hear me okay? Am I coming through okay? Yeah, you're great. Let me know if I start to robot off. Yeah, so thanks for everybody who came out. Hopefully you guys had a good time. We're, we're definitely thinking about doing another one in the future. And uh, when we know more, we'll let you know. Yeah, it was uh, highly successful. We might do more of these um, in different locations. For example, we might do one on the West Coast. Um, California-ish. Which should be sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's get into it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, let's start. So, Aiden Brown says, Hi, Mike and James. Just wondering if I could give you an outline of my upcoming massing meso and give me some feedback on it. Arms and side delts are at four times a week frequency as they will be my main focus throughout the block of training, then increasing to five and hopefully to six times a week for the last meso. Um... By the way, Aiden, that's a good prospective plan. I just have to do due diligence and notifying you that if four times a week is even a bit much and you go to five and it feels like it's just way too much, don't go to six. Um, mm -hmm. he, he does say then hopefully six times a week. So I think head's in the right place. Chest, back, and quads and hams are all three times a week, then uh, only going to four times a week on the last muzzle. It seems mm -hmm. reasonable so far. I'm going to scroll through and see how many. Do you want to share the screen there, James? Or should I share mine? I, I have it on screen share already. Do you want to script? Oh, perfect. No, 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 no. I just, I just scrolled down. Okay, he's got six days, which is good because if you are got some pretty big plans for hypertrophy, you got to train probably something like six days. You know what I'm talking about, James? Like I had to scroll down and see how many days it said because sure. like I – um. I really, it's a, a really strange thing when people are like, I want to grow all these muscles and I'm, I won't, you know, I'm going to train three days a week. <laughs> um, so it's just funny. Yeah. So we might just have to like spit some ideas out here. But one thing I'm just noticing looking through this right off the top, uh, sometimes you kind of go from agonist to agonist muscles and then into kind of other muscles or even antagonists. So like on, for example, day one, wide grip bench, and then you do deficit rows, and then you go into flies. I would say just go into flies, and just keep, your pecs are already nice and warm. No need to get off the train there. In fact, it might even be kind of a potential downside of uh, just not accumulating more metabolites just from keeping on the same muscle group and pushing through. So I think I see that in a couple instances here. I think also like on day two, you see squats, and then good mornings, and then leg extensions. You know what? Just go just blast the quads until they're done probably a good idea and, and the way you know you would think like oh but this means that i have to like prioritize something versus others uh you do but you can do that in some of the days and do the opposite of the other days so like day one mm -hmm. chest focused can be chest first back second uh you know day three or something like that can be back focused where you start with back and then back back and then chest chest like at the end and it ends up being the same net effect i think if at least one study recently published where clustering the muscle group exercises together resulted in more anabolic signaling than separating them. Um, it's one of those cool instances of like, uh, that's what's been done in practice for a long time and only later yeah. gets verified later. Uh, yep. What are lat prayers? That's what I want to know. Mm. Man, that's like when you just sit there and pray for lats, I think. Because I think like prayers makes me think hands together, right? So I'm wondering if it's like a, maybe like a machine like pull 
like a pullover machine kind of thing. Yeah, maybe. Not sure that's, on that one. That's not a reasonable idea. Same idea there. Look, day three, you know, if, if that is what I'm thinking of, or if at the very least, if it's just a back exercise, like just do that right after the rows. Same thing with day, day four. Consolidation. Let's see, day six. And so one thing I'm noticing is here's a constructive criticism that always reminds me of uh, the water boy when he opens up uh, his like recommended things like his suggestion box and it says eat shit and die signed everybody yeah goes, <laughs> not, not exactly what i call a constructive criticism um what's it called <laughs> what is Love movie that movie. Is unbelievably quotable josh vogel had never seen it my jiu-jitsu coach had never seen what it. how do you not see the water like, boy like a year ago i was like watch it you have to watch it so he saw it he's like okay I, I understand all the hype <laughs> it's like this movie is designed for you <laughs> uh also one that nonsense did not age well with the uh with the woke era true but I, I, <laughs> yeah, that means that for me it aged for you and i it aged even better than exactly I um so constructive criticism here is you say earlier that you say that arms and side delts are on four times a week uh, as they will be my main focus throughout the block of training but when i look at your routine arm and belt exercises seem to be last in every single session if they're really the focus, they should be up front. So you should start day one with uh, laterals and, and curls, then get into wide grip bench steps and rows, et cetera. So I would absolutely have that as a correction, James. Yeah, because uh, that's a very good point. Because the way I'm looking at this, this looks like a really well balanced program, but it definitely doesn't look like a, a super shoulder emphasis program to me. I mean, yeah. there is a lot of shoulder exercise, but they're all placed at the end, which is fine. That's how you, if it was like a balanced program, that's how you would do it. So in that regard, yeah. it's good. Uh, but I'm not seeing the like shoulder emphasis either. So I think Mike brought up a good point there. Um, but otherwise, I'm not really seeing any red flags here. Everything else looks good. You might consider, um, he might have already said this, maybe I just missed it, but you might consider putting some of the big movements on maintenance values and, or even, you know, with the thing with the shoulder emphasis is like the shoulders aren't enough to really soak up like the calories that you need for a mass phase. So that might be an instance where you put things on MEV rather than MV just because, uh, be kind of a waste just to do like all the, all those calories for like shoulders and arms. So sure. that might be a good instance where you put like your quads or your, um, Packs or something on MEV values rather than M MV values, something like that. But you might be already doing that, and I just missed it. You're right there, Mike. Okay, then he says, "What if your lectures you see to bias the volume slightly?" Yeah. Oh, maybe there was a delay there. Like it, it, your face like paused, and you were like kind of like bug eyed for a second, and I was like, I couldn't tell if you were making a face at me or not. No, my internet connection was unstable again. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, Sonia. My internet connection is unstable. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm live, by the way. We, we got the, the nicest stuff. Okay, it was unstable last time, too. Just heads up. Uh, Dr. Mike um, Vias, your internet's so unstable. It's just like your lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. Which, which one are you on? Uh, the VPN. Yeah, that's the one we use. Yeah. It sucks. All right. I'm going to get back to this. Um, so let me know if I cut out, James. Will do. I was going to say, I was saying something when I was cut off. Um, in one of your lectures, you say to bias the volume slightly in favor of the 5 to 10 in the first meso, 10 to 20 in the second, and 20 to 30 in the third. The well, setting of the first meso of training is only one exercise for each muscle group and the five to 10 sufficient to bias this way. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then slightly add more volume over the weeks to that same exercise. Or would I need to add another five to 10 exercise? No, I think you're fine. It's a matter of preference there. And again, like that idea being for the emphasized muscles of this, of this gain phase, right? So like, should you be adding lots of sets of five to 10 on bench press? I would say maybe not, because that could just right. be detracting from what you could be doing in shoulders. So uh, a good example of that might be like five to 10 seated barbell overhead press, something like that. Uh, and then adding, you know, sets to that as you see fit. Yeah. 
The plan for the next muscle would be to increase the frequency to four times a week for the big upper body muscle groups instead of three, apart from lower three times a week as all my knees can take. Yeah, I actually just switched back to two times a week on my lower because I couldn't take it. Um, just added an exercise to each of the added day, both of the 10 to 20. Is there anything you'd want to change in the rough split? I guess we could say that. Thanks in advance for taking the time to go through it. Much appreciated. And then he says, hi, Mike and James. <laughs> so good. Sorry, I heard you the cat in the background. Like, wah. Oh, uh, yeah. That's either the cat or the kid. Can't tell which one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, for a client who just wants to get stronger after having a productive block of hypertrophy training, what would be a, a, a the key things in designing a strength micro slash mesocycle? Uh, buy our book, Scientific Principles of Strength Training, and design a mesocycle using that. It was the best answer. But generally speaking, you just want to. You know, I would say if they just did a productive hypertrophy block, and let's assume that it's bodybuilding style hypertrophy, not powerlifting style, because powerlifting style hypertrophy generally occurs almost exclusively in the 5 to 10 rep range. If it's bodybuilding hypertrophy through all the three main rep ranges, all the way from 5 to 30 reps, I, I'm a big fan, and probably James is too, we'll see what he says, of a transitional mesocycle where you do an entire meso more or less in a 5 to 10 range. Uh, and then sort of through the meso, you increase load a little bit more than you would and increase volume less than you would or not at all. So that by the end, you're doing mostly sets of five to eight as opposed to sets of eight to 10. And that really pr pr preps you for the next true strength meso, which is a mostly three to six uh, reps. James? Yeah, I'm uh, massively in favor of that. And I used to move people kind of into like a, a sub group of that called, you know, like a four to eight range. Um, but I'm more in favor yeah. of doing a, like, as Mike said, like a five to 10, and then eventually moving into whatever strength range that you want to use, whether it's closer to maximal or maybe in between, either one's fine. But having that transitional one really does help a lot. Yeah. And then after yeah. that, it's just like, be smart about which movements you want to use, like make sure they're movements that are conducive to their goals or sport. Um, keep the volume in check. Like it's going to be a good jump off point. It's going to be like two thirds of the, the movement volume that you did in hypertrophy. And that's kind of it from there. Yeah. 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 Good call. Mark Villardell says, hi. You're a little robot at the moment. Question is related to them. I hate this. Okay, you're back. When I'm not robot -y. Yeah, you're good. Uh, I'm, again, Mike and James, my question is related to the MPT. If at the beginning of the week I do four sets of squats and later that week I'm still ultra sore from the training, but I can do the same or more reps than the last training session, should I rate it as a zero or as a negative one? Until now I've been rating it as a plus one since I could do more reps, but the fatigue and soreness make me feel tired most of the time. Despite eating a surplus and resting, thanks, Doc. So well, what I will say here is actually uh, now that James and I have been writing this book, and one of the best benefits of writing a book on a subject is you really get to organize your thinking. I don't actually develop it even further because you really connect some dots and close some loops where before was speculation now becomes really very likely because you sort of think of all the things. We can actually give you a pretty definitive answer here. So we're going to sort of a two-part um, auto regulation system around hypertrophy and volume uh, to do mostly with soreness and performance. The thing is, if your performance is increasing within a mesocycle, we don't know what percent of that is because you're gaining muscle and what percent is because of neural or architectural improvements, which can be very, very rapid. But we do know that when you have extreme overlapping soreness, there's a chance you're dipping into your maximum rate of gains by causing an excessive degree of muscle damage that you're at an adaptive pool has to compete with. So our advice is if you have nasty overlapping soreness, either rate it as a zero or a negative one, which means either stabilize or slightly reduce the volume so that you do not have overlapping soreness. Um, now, does the performance indicate that you are recovered? Yes, in the technical sense. But remember, recovered is holistically. That's neural recovery plus muscular recovery, et cetera, et cetera. The nasty overlapping soreness tells us that you're probably not at a volume which optimizes growth, probably a little bit north of that volume. So my advice would be to rate as a zero, so you can catch up to that recovery, or even as a negative one in some cases, if the soreness is very overlapping, very extreme. James? 
Yeah, that was, I have uh, virtually the same answer. I would only add that if you're really feeling tired all the time, as you describe in the question, I would maybe push that to the minus one because it might just be a little too much. Like the combination of both the overlapping soreness and the like kind of lasting fatigue would be an indicator that you're getting like just a lot of systemic like fatigue from that exercise and a lot of local fatigue. So uh, if it was just like overlapping soreness, but performance was pretty stable, I would say zero. But in your situation, you're having that situation plus like the fatigue, I would say minus one. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Leonard Morrison says, Hey docs, I need to limit my training. Am I good, James? Sorry. Yes. I muted myself cause I was eating, <laughs> but you're good. No I need to limit my training to maintenance volumes for at least one year in order to focus fully on my new career as a prostitute. Jesus Christ, Leonard. My objective with training now is to only preserve muscle mass. When training for maintenance for an extended period of time, should my metacycles and macrocycles look essentially the same as they did when I was training for hypertrophy, save for the static volumes during the hypertrophy mesos? Mm, probably not. That's my assumption that I should be training in hypertrophy rep ranges, usually 7 to 16 for me, depending on the muscle, and increasing intensity and closing in on failure from week to week and deloading every fifth week. My assumption is Please correct me. I want to make sure I plan my macro sex. So here's the good news about training for maintenance. Hold on a sec, James. Am I back yet? You're back. Really good news for training to maintenance is that you can cut your total volume for sure by half for a year and see no losses of muscle. There's the fundamental fact that training for maintenance is much easier than training for hypertrophy, for gains. So you don't have to structure it in any way similar to hypertrophy mesos. You can absolutely increase weight on the bar. As a matter of fact, you can train essentially just for strength because it's a cool time to get stronger. But what you can do is, let's say you're training six times a week currently. You can train really in any rep range you want because all the rep ranges conserve muscle just about the same amount. You can train people and do, and James and I do program training in the lower rep ranges just to also get stronger, which is a neat side effect. But get down. <laughs> is low begging for food. He's like trying to put his face in my cup. Oh. Um, you don't have to do that, but you can. So it's optional whether or not you uh, change intensities. You can work through all the intensities. If, if you do very low intensity or sort of very high intensity, very low reps for an entire year, you might have to do a meso here and there where you do very light loads just to get stress off the joints. So you can train it as a training phase, but if you, let's say, or as a strength phase, but if you are normally training six days a week, you can literally maintain muscle by training three days a week, cutting all of the set numbers total per week that you do in half even more really to a third of what they normally are picking any rep ranges really that you like and doing mostly the compound basic exercises and not having to get too fancy with isolations because that just compounds are a really good way to save time, right? Like you do underhand pull-ups and there's your back and there's your biceps pretty much. Right. So, um, Doing that is how you maintain. And do you put more weight on the bar every week? Yes. Do you still deload on occasion when your fatigue rises? Yes. But those deloads may be very uh, big, big gaps between them. Uh, and depends on how, how much weight you put on the bar every week. But um, fundamentally, it should be much easier, much less time commitment, uh, much less complex than hypertrophy training, James. Yeah, and so I think Mike already touched on this, but one of the big differentiating factors, aside from just the, the raw volume, I should have switched the screen back, sorry, um, is the frequency. So you can train at much lower frequencies in terms of sessions per week, but also how frequently you train those muscle groups per week. I mean, so you can literally just change, and Mike already said this, but you can just go down to like three days a week of, of full body training, and that's pretty yeah. much good, which is fucking awesome. Um, you might also find that you might be able to extend your meso lengths depending on whether or not you push the intensity. If you push the intensity, you might not be able to do this. 
But if you do more of a gradual approach on intensity, you might be able to go out for like five, six, maybe even seven weeks before you really need to deload. If you treat it more like a strength phase, you might actually see that window shortening more than normal. So if you normally did like a four and one, if you really push the intensity, you might have to go down to like a three and one. Whereas if you just treat it more like a true bodybuilding style maintenance phase, you might actually only increase the intensity every other week or so. And that might push your mesocycle length out to like six weeks before you need to deload. So that's kind of the two big like fundamental differences. And after that, it's kind of consolidating your exercise selection, conserving variation for later on when you get back to doing more structured, hard training. So just pick a couple basic movements, hit them hard, and your workouts will be short and sweet, my man. Uh, also, does training at maintenance volumes, but with typical hypertrophy rep ranges, desensitize me to hypertrophy training in any meaningful way like regular hypertrophy training does? Um, resensitize. It, it, it does resensitize you, actually, to hypertrophy volumes. And what I need to do a lower rep range resensitizing measure every six months or so when already doing long-term maintenance training? No. So I think what he might have been maybe winking at is like, um, should I be utilizing all the loading ranges or is that maybe a, lo a bad long-term strategy? And I would say mostly no outside of doing like metabolite training. Um, yeah. Even that then at such low volumes, it probably yeah, doesn't desensitize. Exactly. So um, usually we recommend just using the heavier loading zones anyway. And then like kind of in the previous question, maybe even transitioning into non hypertrophy loading zones, like strength zones. Um, but no, it will not. Yeah. Ultimately. Also, should I still be devoting a portion of my volume work to metabolite work or does the utility of that go out the window when you aren't trying to grow? Well, it's literally a special technique designed to grow you. If you're bored, um, if you have some injuries, if you don't want to go heavy, metabolite works great to maintain muscle. Um, but, uh, no, you don't have to do it. Uh, that's the thing. He, here's the fundamental thing. Like all these techniques for growth, they're so overpowered for maintenance that you can use them. It, it, it's similar to a question of, you know, do I take my Lamborghini down the street to get a Slurpee at the 7-Eleven? Like, yeah, you can uh, if you want to show off, <laughs> if you want to see if the Lamborghini still works. Um, but do you have to? No. Do you, if you enter a race, do you have to have a Lamborghini? Yeah. Right. So that, that's a lot of the answers here. Mm -hmm. um, am I still coming through? Okay. Still good, my man. So I, I promise I'm back home next week. I don't it's oh, traveling no bullshit. It's IHF5 fucking hate it. Uh, uh, all right. And then lastly, if I was to change course at some point in the future and decide to train, say chest and tries up to the MRV, but keep everything else in maintenance, but I still need to deal with all the maintenance muscle groups every fifth week of the meso along with MED MRV ones. Yes. For systemic fatigue purposes, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, man. Uh, James Krieger's analysis of the literature on this proved it pretty well. Deloading just straight up doesn't cost you muscle. And because of the resensitization effect, it doesn't cost you time either. Like if you didn't deload, then if you did, in some studies, even incredibly often, way too often, in some of these studies, they didn't even train for weeks at a time. You still gain the same total amount of muscle at the end of six months or at the end of a year. The only benefit of deloading is that it for sure saves you and gives you tons of systemic benefits and reduces injury and all this other stuff. So all of the benefits of not deloading and keep going are completely washed out by all the downsides of doing that. So James and I are pretty clear on this 90% of cases, James, correct me if I'm wrong. If you have to ask, do I deload or not? The answer is deload. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, especially for this demographic that tends to train hard. Like, you know, if, if you train someone who train, wants to deload every two weeks, like, yeah, they're real bitch. Right. But like, that's the only situation really where you yeah. say no. Right. It's like, if they're just, if they're just avoiding doing hard work and then it's like, okay, well, it's not even a question of optimality. Your, your head's already out of the game at this point. Like, yeah. you know, you got bigger fish to fry is kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, and then thanks for all that you do. Scientific principles of strength training. All the articles of Dr. Mike survive strong appearances have proven an invaluable resource. I'm really looking forward to the forthcoming hypertrophy textbook. Hey. It's not a textbook. Brad Schoenfeld's book is the textbook which we'll be referring to in that in the hypertrophy book. But thank you so much. We are. Um, balls deep into editing it. We're actually most of the way through editing it now. And 
it's James. What do you think so far, man? Now that you've yeah, I think it, asked the <laughs> it's great. I actually was editing it earlier today, and I had a, a cool idea, uh, and I was excited about it. And I think it's coming together really, really, really nicely. And I think it'll be a nice resource. I mean, for a lot of RP Plus people, we've kind of spilled the beans on things like SFR and yeah, and the volume landmarks and things like that. But for other people who have never even like thought of this idea, um, I think it'll be a real mind fuck for them. It'll be it'll be a, a you know a nomenclature to to intuition, right? Things that they understand, like in their mind, like, oh, I know this exercise works good for me and this and that, but now there's kind of a system of describing it, which I think people will really appreciate. It's also, I think, one of the only books in muscle growth to go from a repetition and how to do it, theoretically, how what a good technique looks like, all the way to exercise session, microcycle, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to career. Like it really gives you a framework for all of hypertrophy training. And I have never seen anything that does that, you know, like rest times between sets, all that stuff is covered to like, if you have a question about how to train for muscle growth, that book is going to at least send you on a pretty good intellectual trip to think about things. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, absolutely. And that and like in combination with like, I don't want to spill any beans, so cut me off if necessary, but like the uh, hypertrophy guides that are been updated and are going to be yeah. on the website soon. It's just a lot of awesome content. And Mike and I were joking, uh, shooting the shit on text. And it's, I, I just said something to the tune of like, man, can you imagine having this information coming out of high school? Like I would have killed for somebody to oh tell me this God. shit, to have it on a free website. I was, I was the muscular development bodybuilding.com era. Like I, I bought all of that shit and did all the dumbest, stupidest crap there was to do. So like, to me, it's really cool to, that we can put stuff like that out there and people find it valuable because Mike and I have gone through all, we've done all the dumb stuff and it took us a long time to figure out what was dumb and what was useful. So I'm really excited about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Steven uh, Grube says, hey, Doc, it's been a while since my last couple of questions. I just finished about a year. A little choppy. Massing, cutting. Probably only had one month of maintenance in there. I had a stroke of genius. Hello? Sorry, you're a little choppy there, but it looks like you caught up. <clears throat> okay. Am I good? Yeah, you're good. I think by the time that I say it's choppy, you you have already like, you know, gone through a little bit, but that's okay. Yeah, no worries. Um I think uh, stroke of genius is where I think I left off with you. Okay. Stroke of genius slash common sense. I figured this year as my coaching season approaches, I would take my training down to maintenance for the length of the wrestling season because coaching takes so much time and energy and late nights. I don't have it in me to push hard on both fronts. So I, very similar to the last question, I think. Yeah. So I'm looking at three and a half months of much needed maintenance and diet. How should I organize that? Steven. The person, you just go right back to that and we just beat the shit out of it for you. Um, would you agree with that, James, before I keep reading? I'm sorry, Mike. Could you repeat what you said? It, it, Fuck. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was like, grung, 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 grung. James, what do you think of that? I was like, damn it. Oh, my God. Um, do you know how much data it takes to broadcast an hour of video? Is it more than 15 gigs or no? It, uh, it can be, depending on like how high quality the audio and video is. Fuck. Because I have a hotspot on my phone. But it's... Mm, see, it's, it's already cutting out again. 15 gigs a month. Off. I hate this. Um... James, yeah. why don't you uh, take this one? And yeah, I'll, you want me to uh, just read, back. and then you want me to just read, and then you you can we'll just fl we'll flip flop for today. How's that? Yeah, how about you read an answer until I come back? I'm going to try to solve this problem. Sure. If you have a landline, uh, that might be helpful. Okay. So I think Dr. Mike's going to be working on that for a minute. Okay, thanks. Oh boy. All right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Uh, let's just kind of take it from the top since it seems like we got a little off track here. So I had a stroke of genius and common sense. I figured this year, as many coaching, uh, as my coaching season approaches, I would take my training down to maintenance. Jeez. <laughs> this episode's a disaster. All right. I would <laughs> we'll take my training down to maintenance for the, like, the wrestling season because coaching takes so much time and energy and late nights. I don't have it in me to push hard on both fronts, so I'm looking at three – and a half months of much needed maintenance, training, and diet. How should I organize that? I was thinking of working with my 10RM on most movements, low volume, three reps from fail, so approximately seven reps on the first set, mostly heavy compound movements. Should any muscle groups be trained lighter and with higher reps than that? Delts, buys, tries, calves. So first off, that's a great approach. You can basically just take that idea and run with it. You can use, uh, you can do extra like accessory movements if you want to. That's just totally up to you. And you might find that like your, um, if you have like really big arms, for example, you might need to actually do a little bit more like direct bicep or tricep work. Like if you have arms, Dr. Mike size, he might not be able to just do like bench presses and pull-ups to keep that arm size. He might have to do that plus like maybe a few sets of curls or skull crushers or something like that. So that's, that's more of an individual choice that you will have to figure out. But yeah, mostly just like right on point. So anything in that six to 10 rep range, 10 rep max, three from fail puts you right in that range. That's so going to be around seven reps. So pretty good. If you wanted to do some higher rep stuff, that's also fine, especially if you feel like you get a good response in certain rep ranges and certain movements. So like if you wanted to do, you know, side laterals uh, into the 10 to 20 range, that's fine. So long as the volume came down, all good there. So yeah, you basically take that approach, run with it and you can drive the intensity and just treat it like a strength phase. Kind of the same as the last couple of questions we had. Okay. Second question do I increase weight sets or proximity to fail as the weeks go? I'm thinking definitely not increase volume as I need to resensitize, but it's maintenance. Do I need a progressive overload on any parameters at all or just stay with uh, week one numbers? So you do need to change it a little bit over time. So usually what we recommend is once you make the initial switch to maintenance to really bottom out those volumes on week one and then kind of bring them, what would be kind of your standard maintenance volume in week two. And then basically the volume from that point on unchanged for the most part, outside of just doing more reps, right? You're not going to add any more sets at that point, unless you start to notice that you're deconditioning and then you could add some sets. Um, you can absolutely increase weight. You can absolutely increase proximity to failure, though you don't necessarily have to. It's still a good idea because you will um, over time, acclimate to the training that you're doing. And that's just the reality, right? So it's not a bad idea to increase in weight, even if it's a true resensitization maintenance phase, like every other week or so. If you wanted to treat it more like a strength phase, you would uh, increase the weight every week. And in some cases, like we said in the previous question, that might shorten the, the mesocycle length. Or if you just uh, do it like every other week or every two weeks or something like that, it might actually increase it. So definitely increase the proximity to failure on a grand scale, like start from three from fail, run that for two weeks, and then do like two weeks of two from fail. And then you could maybe even do another week of two from fail or move into one from fail, depending on how long your projected mesocycle will last. So yeah, you do increase on some things, but definitely not volume. Just volume is like a very bare bones start really low, start like abysmally low, and then maybe go up once and then cut it off for the rest of the time. Okay. <clears throat> Next, I'm looking at three and a half months of this. How often should I deload if it's just maintenance training? So we kind of covered that in the other one. It mostly depends on whether or not you're just doing resensitization stuff where you're not really progressing much in intensity or <coughs> if you're doing more strengthy stuff. Then uh, you'll be deloading more often. So you can kind of take what you normally do as a good starting point. And if you find that by the time you get to what would be the end of a normal uh, accumulation phase, and you're kind of still just good, really not any wear and tear to speak of, you can just push it out and kind of see how far you can go. Um, so I would say start like your normal one, and then you can auto regulate from there. If you're not pushing the intensity, you could plan on probably doing an extra week. And if you are pushing the intensity, probably plan on shaving off a week. Um, or auto-regulate it and take a deload when I feel beat up or performance decreases. That's always a good choice. Can't argue with that one. Lastly, a few joints feel rough from the past mesocycles of training, most notably my shoulder. I did incline dumbbell bench for two sets and flat bench for one set with my 10RM and my shoulder hurt. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't really want to take out the benching motions because that kills all my heavy weight compounds. Should I go lighter? Uh, weight higher rep range? You can do that. Swap it out 
completely for flies and peck deck type movements. Maybe, maybe not. That is an option. I know it's going to hurt for my next chest test in two, incline hammer press, flat cambered bar bench, and dips. I'm curious your thoughts on that one. So what I would say is it's probably your, – your train of thought's correct. I would say it's probably in your best interest not to take out the push movements, the compound pushing entirely. Maybe just play around with variations that just don't hurt your shoulder. So, for example, if flat – you know, regular grip is hurting your shoulder. Try wide, try close grip. If the, if the incline dumbbell is hurting your shoulder, try incline barbell, you know, just play around with the different grips until you can find one that's pain free. If you are just up shit out of luck, shit Creek, whatever you want to say, um, then you might decide to swap to something like, um, Oh, sorry. So the next thing you would do is try the lighter rep ranges, right? So that would be the next chain of command type activity. So you, you try different exercise variations, then you try the lighter rep ranges. And if the lighter rep ranges are still hurting your shoulder, then you would switch to like pec fly or a pec deck type movements. But I would save that as the last option. So mostly just try and find like a workaround, the, uh, exercise modification being first rep range second. And then if you need to switch to isolations go from there all right hey my james i hear you there you go i'm back and i um my uh, brother-in-law gave me a password for a better network that's closer so it looks like oh, he was gonna let me know if he was holding out on you oh yeah shit. okay let me know if that's okay uh you sound way better uh excellent yeah i thought all those answers were great i have nothing to add oh, okay cool let's uh pick up then with uh john howarth Okay, John Haworth says, the RP Summit went well. I guess he was at the RP Summit. Um, oh, he said, hope the RP Summit went well. Jesus Christ, I don't really require that. It was a disaster. <laughs> um, three questions for you guys. Number one, what is the reasoning for daily undulating periodization? Does it alleviate the need for the resensitization phases by incorporating the strength training along with higher volume training in the same mouse cycle? No, or same microcycle? No. no, it does not do that. Looks like that is used in the older 2017 hypertrophy hub examples. But the male physique template doesn't seem to work like that. Just curious. So male physique uh, template is a little bit uh, more simplified. And the male physique template uh, does what you could say is block undulating periodization <laughs> uh, or block periodization, um, which it can see. Uh, mass and cycle to mass cycle to mass cycle. It does some different things. Um, uh, we now hold the view, James and I, that some combination of uh, within microcycle, within mass and cycle, and within block difference in um, intensities is a good idea. So there's actually a lot of nuance between those two. Uh, so our answer is you probably need to be doing all of them, but there needs to be logic to them. The reasoning for DUP for hypertrophy training is that you have a certain volume allotment. And if you do all of that in the super heavy range, you're probably going to just work your joints right off the body. So you might need to do lighter work just to do enough volume. If you only ever do lighter work, you might be missing out on some specific benefits of very heavy training, particularly for faster fibers and some of the stronger muscles. So by doing all of the ranges, 5 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, you might be getting a little bit more benefit than doing just any one of the ranges. Though if you only ever did the 10 to 20 range, you'd probably get 95% of as big as you would anyway. Um, so DUP in this case is an optimization strategy, not a requirement. Um, DUP in powerlifting or in strength training is a little bit of a different idea, but mostly uses the concept of variation to allow you to manage fatigue very well and present overloading stimuli without doing too much uh, for too long. Uh, James, any additions to that? Yeah, that's actually the direction I was going to go. So it, it, the, the reasoning for DUP will vary depending on the, the goal of the program entirely, right? So like Mike already mentioned, I mean, even the, the stuff that we recommend that you guys do in terms of varying your exercises, varying your, your, vo your volumes, your priorities, your loading ranges, I mean, those are all examples of DUP in a bodybuilding context, however you want to spin it, right? A lot of people will say DUP is all these other crazy things, um, but really all they're trying to do is like systematize something that has very broad general, general applications and is something that's been part of periodization for a very long time. Uh, if you were to look at sport training, right, you see kind of a, a maybe I would say a slightly stronger case, maybe not um, the best case for using DUP in the sense of fatigue management and variation, right? Because then you get the benefits of using heavy loading and then uh, heavy power outputs 
different times throughout the week, which kind of make sure that you have an elevated sense of preparedness for any one of those activities on any given days, though that could still be achieved uh, through just very reasonable programming. So I'm not a very big fan of like the DUP in the sense of like the very uh, like modern as in like the last 10 to 15 years interpretation of DUP, but I am a fan of it in the classical sense, yep. which is what I'm most gonna sports scientists do. Number two, if not actively prepping for a competition, what are your thoughts on tracking calories and protein with evenly spaced feedings? Is that good enough for scenarios outside of contest prep? As long as you also eat mostly healthy foods, I think you're fucking golden, James. Sorry, uh, I'll, I'll, oh, well, I was rereading it, sorry. Um, that's okay. I do have an amendment to what I answered. Um, I think that that's totally cool as long as you don't eat too little carbohydrate. Um, oh, I see. Okay. And as long as you're, ah, shit, my original answer sucked. I misread the question a little bit in my own head as thinking of contest prep as just a more serious time. If you're a bodybuilder, you can do better than just eating some mix of fat and protein. And here's why. Some individuals, if they undereat fat too much, get into a problem where their hormonal levels aren't any good, they get training energy, and they might get hurt more often. On the other hand, if they eat too much fat and not enough carbohydrate, what they end up doing is not having great pumps, um, not healing fast enough, anabolic machinery might not work as well, and they actually don't get as big as they could, and they get extra fat. So I think it's worth sticking roughly to consuming most of your protein or sorry, most of your above protein calories as carbs, but enough as fats to check the boxes. There is some nuance there as to how much that is. So for example, let's say you have a combination of, you know, roughly sort of 600 grams of protein slash fat. I know that they don't include the calories, but it's pretty close. 600 grams of protein slash fat to eat per day. How much of that do you eat? I think there's a fine case to be made for eating as little as 350 grams of carbs and 250 grams of fats uh, or 200-ish grams of fats or something. I think there's a fine case to be made for eating, you know, up to, gee, you know, 550 grams of carbs and only 50 grams of fats. But I think less than 50 grams of fats or less than 350 grams of carbs when those are the macros are stated starts to really push into the limits of too much fat, not enough carbs, and the other way around. So if your normal diet just feeds you the kind of like, for example, if your normal meals are like pasta with sauce, brown rice with chicken, blah, 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 and you have some ice cream on top of that, you're totally fine just tracking calories and protein. But if you're eating nothing but bacon and, and almonds for three days or something and some protein shakes, or you're just like, oh, you're just into the clean eating thing where you eat tilapia, rice, and lettuce for three weeks straight and your testosterone tanks into shit, then apparently the calories and protein thing wasn't that great uh, of a situation. And I will say one more thing. Like if, if you're going to compete in contest prep, contest prep is, is the sort of one of the wisdom, pieces of wisdom of bodybuilding. And this is something all bodybuilders pretty much agree on that have uh, competed um, long enough is that the guys that get the best relative to their genetics treat the off season pretty seriously. That's not to say they treat it as seriously as contest prep, but they, they don't just fuck off. So we got the, the, the variable of protein calories, and that's two variables, or we can have proteins, carbs, and fats. That's three variables is one extra variable of tracking and, and allotment really going to kill you. No. Can you still have an amazing, super fun time? Uh, eating super fun foods and training really hard on an off season by tracking fats and carbs. Yes. So I think it's worth tracking both. Um, can you do just tracking calories and protein? Yeah. If you don't go to extremes. Yes. James. Yeah. I thought that was a great answer. Um, I did a lecture. I think it was in Calgary and I think they posted an RP plus on, um, I just called it physique and lifestyle, which kind of outlines the trade-offs of when yeah. you should be more fussy about those things. And maybe when you have you're multiple shooting. categories, right? Yeah. And it just kind of breaks it down based on how, how involved you are in either the sport of physique or just how, how lofty your aspirations are. Mm -hmm. So this I don't one know says contest prep. <laughs> yeah. So. so, so that means it's probably a regular competitor. And mm -hmm. uh, in the two examples I give that would give like you in the one or two category. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lecture, I think it's on RP plus, or it might be on YouTube. I think it's just called like balancing physique and lifestyle or something like that. And that's just kind of same idea of what Mike said, maybe give you some perspective. Yeah. But the, 
TLDR, the perspective in their lectures, if you do compete, you should probably track your carbs and fats. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then how, how, how laxed you are really is how laxed you want to be with your, your goals, really. And that's a matter yeah. of lifestyle and trade-off at that point. Yeah. Number three, relating to above question, I grew up overweight, maybe even obese. So I understand I have a lot more fat cells than I might otherwise have had. Does that impact how I should build my surplus in terms of fat slash carbs? Would it be beneficial to prioritize one or the other to keep fat cells under control? Or is that more in terms of surplus size? As far as I'm aware, it's exclusively in terms of surplus size. Um, maybe wise to err on the lower side when attempting to mass. Um, are you maybe, maybe wise. I don't I think know. that's a good strategy. It's, it's probably not a bad strategy in general if you're just prone to being over fat. Sure. But, but just for like an average price, if you got your shit in under control and you're not worried about like jobbing out all the time, I don't know. I don't, you don't have to be unnecessarily restrictive either, right? I mean, here's my thinking, James. Let's say someone weighs 200 pounds and they go on the high end of our massing recommendations, which means they gain a pound a week, right? And let's say they do that for 16 weeks. That's 16 pounds. You mean, is that the end of the world to lose on a fat loss phase? No. No. And like, and do you see, it, does the fat hit you out of nowhere? Also no. Like, at, half a, at a pound of a week of gain, which is very fast, you're going to notice when you're getting fatter. You're going to notice at eight weeks, you're going to notice at 12, and you can always slow down or do a mini cut and get back to zero net fat gain. Yeah, doing only a sum total of half a pound a week may be better. That means you'd gain only two pounds per month. Um, but the thing is also like at two pounds per month, the real determinant of how fat you get is how long you do that for. You know, the size of the surplus per week, unless it's crazy, really doesn't matter much. It's how long, you know, if you mass for two years straight, sort of doesn't matter how slow you go. You're going to put some weight on uh, if you can even measure how, you know, month to month. Oh, wow. <laughs> That actually is the cat. Where's the, where's the cat? Where's the kitty? I can't see the cat. Well, she is really <laughs> yelling up a storm. Pissed. Um, so, so, yeah, I think the, a, a real, a better answer we could give you is, you know, if you're prone to fat gain, pick a normal rate, maybe even a slow rate. But I think normal rate is fine. What you should really do is, the big good advice is watch your physique every month or so in the mirror. And uh, oh, there's the cat. You ready? Am I on camera, James? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. She's like, as soon as I fucking flip the camera, this cat runs away. Ready? And. Oh, there's the key. Hi. She wants some love. And yes. You like it in there? Oh, yeah. my. <laughs> You're a talking cat. <laughs> Love it. So basically, like, our best advice, I don't think, is to really care a ton about how fast you gain weight, but don't disappear and get fat. Like, James and I must have had about a trillion clients over the years and people we consult that are less clients and folks we just stay in touch with that, like, will be like, ask us all these super precise questions. How do I mass? rate of gain, blah, blah, blah. And then we won't, they, you know, we'll hear from them for one or two months and then we won't hear from them for a year and a half. And it'll be like, hey guys, I'm up 50 pounds. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? At what point did you run off the rails? Like, so our best advice is don't run off the rails. Gain 10 to 20 pounds and then rein it back in by another 15 to 17 pounds and then repeat the process. You know, yeah. just don't nuts and gain a shitload of weight. And those are the people who typically like abandon their diet template mostly altogether. Yes. Where they start off good and then it's just like, all right, Chinese buffet, pizza, like what, you know, they just say like, fuck it, what, I just need to eat because it's mass season. They, yeah. That's when you really start to spiral. So as long as you stay on template, you treat it with the same level of rigidity that you would have cut, like you'll be okay. The nice thing about mass is you can have those nice treats and you can go out and have some fun and it's not as devastating as when you're on cut. So you should still take advantage of those things. But if you're prone to jobbing out, maybe keep, Keep a little, keep keep the same level of strictness when you mess. Yep, hundred percent. All right, so the man that exclusively hacks, Daniel oh, Hacker. 
said, we've talked about cardio during a mask before. Would you say a simple five minute cardio warm up before a training session would suffice as enough? No, I wouldn't say that. Six training sessions once a day, equaling 30 minutes of lists a week. 30 minutes of lists a week is like you walk your girl that you're dating to her car twice. Like, Espe- yeah, especially for a, one of the things like with cardio is like there is a duration component. I mean, it's, it's not just like a summative thing where you just sum these like minutes. From a neat perspective, yes, that, that is that. But I mean, like from a cardio perspective, no, that's not going to cut it. I would say if it's that little cardio, just do more neat. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, James, what would you say? Uh, a minimum of 15 minutes per session to get like the real robust per session benefits. I mean, yeah, that, that's Be really kind it. of like a threshold. And that's, I mean, like, that's assuming like low to moderate intensity. Like you can mm-hmm. do like 10 minutes if you're doing high intensity stuff yes. and, and hit the minimum kind of benefit dose. Um, but for, for this, like you, the only way to benefit from the low intensity stuff is to do it longer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that, that's the trade off. You've got to do more of it. All right. Next question. I've had flat and inclined barbell pressing for the last two mesos, 12 week hypercaloric period. Oh, hypocaloric period. I'm going to be doing three weeks of low volume training, one week uh, deload and two weeks at MD before starting a long mass. I'll still be doing them during low volume phases, these presses. The pressing doesn't feel stale, but it would have been 15 weeks, albeit some of that at low volume that I was doing those presses. Should I keep them in for the first mass meso or swap them out for flat and inclined dumbbell presses? Last time I did flat and inclined dumbbells was 12 weeks ago, and these were my pressing variants before the cut. I know exercise momentum is awesome, so it seems like it would flow so perfect to switch to dumbbells as I move into a hypercaloric period and they just get big PRs rather than have the barbell press in for likely just one meso and switch into a meso two for the mass. However, the barbell doesn't seem stale, so I'm wondering if there are PRs that I could be leaving on the table. I mean, you could definitely be leaving PRs on the table. I think, I think at this point it's one of those, like, um, if we went through the, uh, the sort of guideline of when to, which I just edited, James, by the way, in the book, the guideline of when to change exercises, deletion and replacement of the book, if we went, it, it would, the conclusion would be like, you could go either way, and you really could. Um, what I would consider suggesting is to simply switch grip widths on the barbell pressing uh, and not even go to dumbbells, but do still the barbells, keep the momentum train running, but do the grip widths a little differently so that you can have kind of the best of both worlds of variation, but still similar to what you were doing. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. So like kind of what, what are the trade-offs here? So like on the one hand, you could be setting yourself up for a pretty robust like PR, which is cool, self-affirming, and it may be a good indicator that you've actually done a really good job on your training, which might translate to better long-term goals when you start massing and stuff later on. Uh, what could you gain from switching it now? What actually might be really nice to switch the movements and benefit from that variation because your MEV goes down on the later mesocycle, right? So you can start with a lower MEV and expand out further as you go, which has its own benefits. So it's really kind of what you think is the most appropriate at this course. Do you think it's worth trying to set yourself up for a big PR or do you want to ease into your next phase a little bit and have that little uh, extra margin, excuse me, a little extra wiggle room uh, to span that huge MEV to MRV gap? It's up to you. Is there um, (laughs) It's really noisy, Mike. Is there any way we can? Yeah, I will yell at my family for you. Mama Senka? It's really noisy. No worries. Thank you. Sorry. Take that, blood relations. <laughs> so, no worries. Okay, so Merchia Balai says Hi, Docs. My question today is regarding the mythical gray area between oh MD God. and ME. That was the section I was just like editing, not but like oh, that's an awesome. hour ago. <laughs> Gray area between MV and MEV. Is there any getaway of estimating if you are in this gray area? It would be hard to define because MEV training will cause some soreness and some pump, but MV is defined as the minimum volume needed to maintain current muscularity. Therefore, the gray area in training would have the same characteristics as MV training because by definition, any measure of pump and soreness will get you into MEV training. For advanced individuals, take an entire mouse cycles to figure out MV. Adjust to one's current level of advancement would take too much time anyway. Training for hypertrophy, so a ghetto estimator would be useful to see if one is wasting volume in the gray area or not. Uh, hope I managed to make sense. Hello, all things. As always, managed to make perfect sense. Uh, Meritia, I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't think we have a ghetto estimator for the gray area because the gray area is technically not a landmark, but um, it's a very, very good thinking. Um, what I will say is this is why it pays to occasionally run your... So, so here's, here's good news. Through the course of your training, all everything at some point should run maintenance volumes. 
right? Uh, whether it's through resensitization phases where you do maintenance for your whole body or de-emphasis, de-emphasis periods where just body part by body part or muscle group by muscle group you do decent um, maintenance volume training. At some point, maintenance volume should come up. The algorithm to figure out maintenance volume is one of do a mesocycle at a certain volume below your MEV and see if you gained or lost or maintained. If you gained, go lower. If you maintained, go lower. <laughs> if you lost, go up and then stay and see if you maintain again. So basically, until you lose performance and muscularity and known movements from a certain level of training, the next time you do that maintenance volume, you should knock it down by one or two sets and try to repeat it again. It's a search for the bottom. So there is no ghetto algorithm that we have, you know, ghetto method that we have figured out yet. And we might give some thought to that sort of thing. But for the time being, I think getting to know your real MV over time should be something you know. The real good news is that MV, as you get stronger and better trained, the higher training level means you need more stimulus to keep your adaptations. But the increase in strength means that that stimulus is already coming in from just heavier weights. So, uh, pretty much another way of saying is the number of sets it takes to maintain doesn't really change much from early intermediate all the way into super advanced. Um, so once you find your MVs, they tend to be pretty stable. Um, and once you found them, you can just go down to them and avoid the gray area because you know your MVs and you know your MEVs. So just don't be in that area between James. Yeah. And so kind of the, the thing with the MEV um, is that it's the, the, the minimal point of measurable, like tangible progress. And that was a caveat that we were very like uh, particular about when we started defining those terms. So the, the, and Mike already described this, like, you know, you're at MEV when you're actually making performance progress. That's a definite cutoff. So we have the ghetto estimators, but we also have a, 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 a non-ghetto estimator, which is always performance. So if your performance is going up, you are most likely at MEV, right? And so that's a really easy thing to measure and define anything less I mean, after trying to figure out what's less than that is a matter of guess and check and trial and error, right? Mm -hmm. With the uh, MVs, same idea and all the steps that Mike already described, but I mean, basically err on the side of going lower than you think. And then mm -hmm. the, the space between lower than you think and what you have measured as your MEV, right? Because you've seen performance increases, that's that. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually more simple than you might think. It's a good thought process, but the, the application really only, I think, I think advanced lifters, like people, like advanced bodybuilders, advanced power lifters are probably the only people who are really going to find themselves struggling. In the gray with, area in anyway. The gray area. Most other people, it's going to be like, either I'm progressing or I'm not. And my maintenance volume is just, it, it's just tiny either way. But the thing is advanced power lifters and bodybuilders also have the wisdom of the years behind them. So they know their MVs or at least they should like even pro bodybuilders who just do none, no intellectualizing at all about their lifting. A lot of times you can ask them like, Hey, how much do you need to train your shoulders for them to really not lose size? Most of them would be like, it's this much. And most of that, that's just really not that much. Some guys have such great genetics for like legs or something. They'll train legs. Like I know multiple bodybuilders are trained legs once a month when they're trying not to grow their legs because anything, cause you know, they have like the easily train hard. They, they could easily train them once a week, just really easy, but they train them hard once a month. And that literally just conserves all their size for 12 months straight. So if you're not advanced, there is not much of a gray area. If you're advanced, you should have so many MVs, estimations and MEV estimations under your belt that you shouldn't know the differences between the two. Yeah. And so just like it's the MV is kind of a funny conundrum over time, because if we're just looking at a pure dose response relationship, we would actually expect the MV to creep up a little bit over time, mm -hmm. right? Just from a pure, like all the dose stuff like goes up, right? The longer you go, the more it goes up. So we would expect it to shift to the right, like everything else does. But we also have the combination of long-term like motor learning, so we have lots of neural efficiency, lots of familiarity with movement patterns, and we have long-term body composition changes, right? Which basically counteract a lot of the effects of that dose shift that we would see. So what we see with advanced people is they can basically do very little and whatever they lose comes back immediately if they mm -hmm. lost anything at all. So it's kind of a weird conundrum where on the one side, training, being advanced means your volume landmark shift up, but just being alive and having trained for a long time shifts it way back down. It, probably a net, maybe even negative in some cases, which is a weird conundrum. I just fully, still don't fully understand it. Yep. All right. On to YouTube.
Yeah, no, questions. Uh, no live questions. So YouTube. We're going to do one. This is really something to, by the way, folks, we're going to probably bring the sports scientists back for every couple of weeks, but it'll be through Skype, Skype call format, a ghetto version of sports scientists. Um, oh, jeez. But, Everybody uh, was, everybody's been asking about sports scientists. Yeah, so for sure. Um, I just, well, you weren't, oh man, James, you were out of commission. Saturday night, we watched the secret episode that we never aired. Uh, the one with, uh, <laughs> you know who, and it was just dying. It was just, it was the, it was the best, it was the best thing ever. Um, but in any case, uh, just to take a little page out of sports scientist, I, I got us, I got to respond to this because it's just fucking hilarious. Paul Potter. Can you screen share it at all? Yeah, let me try this. Make sure I don't have any porn. Yep. And we're good on that. Uh, share screen. We good? Yeah. Paul Potter. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Natty fatty powerlifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get to we'll get to that in a second. Uh, <laughs> take a look at the highlighted. Paul Potter comment. This definitely wins in cell of the year award. Ooh, Mike nice. looks like a Santaran from Dr. Who. Great content though. Paul, I'm going to rip on you a little bit. This is all a joke. It's totally cool. We're all just fucking around. So here we go. Great content though, means that looking like a Santaran from Dr. Who is a sort of implied negative that like, if the content wasn't great, this would be definitely a downside and we would fall below average as far as media is concerned. First of all, second of all, what the fuck is a Centaurn from duck kind of incel shit? Is that motherfucker? You got no hobbies? What kind of bullshit you watching? <laughs> what kind of, you clearly have no friends. It's, what are you talking about? Nobody normally, knows what that is. Normally fuck. this would be my time to shine. I'm, I'm usually in all the nerdy stuff, but uh, I didn't ever follow Dr. Who. Motherfucker done left you behind in mm-hmm. nerd heaven. That's right. You got me. God damn. Centaurn. That's some whack ass shit. Where's Marcos? Where's Marcos? I, I know. Where's- I know. Dude, I, we, we got left behind in the incel race on this one. <laughs> For awesome. sure. The all incel 5K. <laughs> That's right. All in good fun, Paul. Uh, thank you for your comment. All right. So let's get to the real questions. I'm going to start with this one by Ozzy. It's good to have Mr. Osborne himself get into this. Very fun. So it's questions for gurus. If I try to rip through reps, I can do way more than if I do them systematically. And there is variance even if I try to do them the same. Did I get 10 reps because I sped up a little type thing? Also, getting psyched up dramatically changes reps completed. Sure. These things that increase variability make it hard to reliably treat rep count as a measure of performance. So it's hard to know if I'm improving. Thoughts? Thanks for all you do. So I'll take a shot at this first, James, and if you want to play cleanup, that would be great. Yeah. Here's the deal. What you need to do is first and foremost, reduce as much variance as you can by nearly religiously subscribing to the idea that you're going to do your reps as systematically and as perfectly as possible. There is a reason we are technique sticklers. There is a reason you don't fuck around and arch your back just a little on those curls and just speed up a little bit or whatever, because you're not racing to anywhere. Here's how rep counts actually work. You do the perfect rep. Then you do the perfect rep. Then you do a shitty rep by accident. It's okay. The next one is the perfect rep. You count as you go, and then you count at the end how many reps you got, and then you compare it to your past performance. If you're a very mature lifter, you can look at your reps that you got last week and try to hit that goal, but every single time while you're doing rep, you have to have a connection with yourself to know I am not going to bullshit myself. I am not just here to fuck around. I'm here to do perfect reps, mind-muscle connection, stimulus to fatigue ratio, and so on, and so on, and so on. That dedication won't help you right away a lot. It will help you some, but over the years of training, it will make your efforts much, 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 much more precise. Secondly, getting psyched up is a thing you should not be doing in hypertrophy training short of maybe the last week and only a little bit, right? So stop psyching up because psyching up is really crappy for the stimulus to fatigue ratio, plain and simple. Uh, It's just a lot of fatigue for almost, you're very little stimulus added. So stop doing that. If you want to psych up, powerlifting's cool, and you can psych up there during competitions. And 
You can watch Chad Wesley Smith's videos where he tells you not to psych up during training. So if you really like to psych up, just, I don't know, go psych up on your own spare time. It's not a good thing to do in most kinds of training, uh, in only some kinds of competition. That's what porn um, is for. Exactly. Yeah, you get just yell at the dominatrix on the screen. I mean, I would never watch porn like that. But anyway, um, <laughs> so um, already, if you do those two things, dedicate yourself to really good technique and stop psyching up, you have decreased the variability considerably. Second of all, remember that our performance feedback methods or systems or algorithms, they don't really care about one-time performance. So for example, the calculation that tells you you've hit MRV is a two session in a row under performance, okay? So you're supposed to get 10 reps in the curl, you got eight reps last week, and then later in that week, you got six reps when you were supposed to get 10. Now we got something to do with it. And if you really don't believe that you're underperformed because you really can say, well, I was much slower reps. Cause remember you were there for your training. You remember what it's like, right? Uh, then you can give yourself a third workout to see And If a third workout's down in performance, well, look, it's not a fucking accident, right? Then you just deload and repeat because you clearly did hit MRV. So yes, variance is totally okay because measures of performance are not perfect, but they're not supposed to be. And then you say, it's hard to know if I'm improving. Now, that really stood out to me. Remember, within an accumulation phase, you're not necessarily supposed to improve. You're probably supposed to put more and more weight on the bar. RIR is supposed to go down for a net really close to the same level of performance. But you accumulated a lot of fatigue and gained a lot of fitness during that time. Once you drop the fatigue in a deload, next mesocycle, you start at a new normal, at a higher level of performance. Now, we're only asking you for one thing. Your last mesocycle, is it worse or better than your current mesocycle? Now, if you can't tell two mesos apart, you're for sure not improving, <laughs> right? Like, so that basically solves all the problems. Remember, performance estimation is not supposed to be perfect. But if you really focus on your technique, don't bullshit yourself with your ego, stop psyching up, and take multiple performance measures over the course of the weeks instead of just like, oh, this one session determines everything, then you start to get a really good, though not perfect, uh, performance index that works to auto-regulate your training, James. That was a really great answer. Uh, the only thing I wanted to a little touch on too here is um, it can be difficult getting the right balance of arousal that is appropriate for training, but not to the point of like what we would call a psych up. So that is something that does take practice to your credit. I mean, it's, it's easy to say, not easy to do. So it's something that you should work on. I think one thing that might be helpful for you is, and he didn't mention this, but this is, this is usually how this question comes up. Um, what might be worth your time is to use a psych up maybe at the end of the mesocycle to figure out um, like do an AMRAP set for yourself to really help you with the RIR stuff. I don't know if you're using RIR, but that's usually how this question comes up is like, should I get psyched up? My reps are different and it's hard for me to gauge RIR. That's one of the times where getting psyched up and doing a true, you know, very close to, if not a maximal effort safely, by the way, um, can be useful. Cause let's say you put 225 pounds on the bench you got fucking pumped up for your set. You got 10 reps, but that was it. You, you had nothing left. Well, now you know that that's your 10 RM. And now you know how to program your bench press in the different loading zones using different RIRs from that point on. So that's a really useful tool. So it just takes a little bit of practice. I would reserve those for that purpose. And that would be a, only occur at the end of a mesocycle. And then just practice on being kind of up, but not losing your mind. And um, if you're taking too much like pump up drink, that can influence it. If you're like, if you're like me and sometimes you get distracted and you're dilly dallying with emails and work stuff when you should just be focusing on lifting, that could go in the other direction as well. So just, just work on it. It's, it comes with time and practice. While we're beating this to death, I think another good uh, thing that I personally do, your first mesocycle, or sorry, your first microcycle of training, try your best to do like three or four RIR and write the reps down. In your next microcycle of training, just match the reps. That's your goal. Tells you exactly how many reps to do, match the reps, try to, of course, do all the things where your reps are high quality, so on and so forth. And if the RIR is like sometimes one and sometimes four, no big deal. Add a little weight to the bar next week and then match the reps again. Add a little weight, match the reps. When it takes heaven and earth and all the psych ups in the world and you cannot match reps, you're for sure over MRV, then it's time to deal it. So it gives you a really unequivocal thing. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, instead of doing like oh, eight reps one week, 12 another, and then back to 10, and am I improving? I don't know. Just do 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, right? And then when you can't hit 10s anymore, be, be slowly increasing weight and volume the entire time, then you're overreached. 
and the, uh, because your average RIR is within the zone that you want, then you're good to go, and everything else is really nitpicky. Solid. All right, Benjamin Turgeon says, uh, what would be an acceptable amount of weight to gain right after a cut to account for glycogen and water? So say you end a cut at 180, and the days after you finish, you meet at maintenance and regain two to three pounds. Would that should be glycogen and water, thanks. So my first answer to this question is, why does it matter? You should be, your weight should inform your decisions in one to two weeks time, not several days time. What happens in several days is irrelevant. Um, Secondly, if you do all the right things and don't binge like a piece of shit, then <laughs> you'll be fine either way. And lastly, uh, up to 10 pounds, actually, after a nasty enough cut, is can be glycogen and water. Um, if you, I, I would I'd go so far as to say is nothing really surprises in the first week unless it's like 15 or 20 pounds. It's the second week that matters. Okay? After the second week, you should be gaining that much. If you're still gaining a lot in the second week from the first week to the second, eh, I should probably slow down your eating. If you're gaining from the second to the third and it's like three pounds again, that's not glycogen and water. So glycogen and water only occurs for probably about the first week. After the first week, things should really level out. If they haven't, whatever you're telling yourself is maintenance is not maintenance. Yeah. And that'll be really obvious because the first week or maybe even two weeks, depending on how long and hard you were cutting for, you'll see peaks and valleys in your weight. It'll be like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then it will flatline at some point. Right. And that's when you'll know where you're, yeah, it's no longer just water variation. Uh, I think for inter, like I would say for most intermediate females between zero and five pounds is very common when making the switch from cut to maintenance. And for most intermediate males between five and 10 pounds is like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bat an eye if I saw that. I'd, I'd be like, yeah, that's okay. kind of standard. But like Mike said, if it's like 20 pounds and it doesn't come back down with the subsequent valley, like, yeah, you're just, you're just going too hard. Yep. Menno Henselman's, I had to re-ask him a story when I see him in India in a couple of weeks. Um, he had a client story that he had a client gain some amount of fat in some time. Like that was, I think he gained back almost his entire cuts worth. And he had like a 20 week cut almost his entire cut's worth of body fat back in two weeks. <laughs> um, because he, and so Menno What are you tra- doing? Menno had him track his intake. He was eating, I think, fifteen to 20,000 calories a day. Oh, um, my God. Yeah, he just flipped that ghrelin leptin switch, and it just just went straight to hell. Yeah. That's one of those, like, um, that's a clinical level, like, uh, eating disorder behavior, right? That's like, you, you need to be on supervised behavior at that point. Like, yeah, <laughs> that actually endangers your internal organs in acute sense. Like you can, yes. you can stretch your stomach to a, a point of having needing surgery. Like you can rip esophageal tissue if you uh, start throwing up with that much food in you. Yeah. So and like the cardiac stress of that rapid yeah, of weight change is like gnarly yeah. blood pressure or so on and so forth. Yeah. Oh man. All right. Uh, to wrap it up, last question here. Granik Yim, which is a sweet name. A weird name. All right. Says at 109.34 on this last video, does Mike say you can break this point where many natties are at the natty limit or the point where they are and they think it's the limit by just forced feeding? I think a higher caloric surplus is not better than a lower. What is Mike experience in that method? <laughs> this is fucking baller shit. I wish I could write like that. Um, is it? It's interessant. I have never heard of the method in the scientific community. <laughs> Everybody say lean bulk is the optimal. Is is very um, German. I'm wondering if he's like this German is, this or is Scandinavian. Like, this is like a letter someone would write before they committed suicide in the last days of the third. <laughs> <line>. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> dot. <laughs> I also like that the last sentence, every word is capitalized. Amazing. Amazing. Can Mike oh, share not every word, almost experience everywhere. except for experience? Uh, because my experience is not a capital offense. Um, so this is a very good question. Um, let, let us be very clear what James and I meant by uh, James. Remember the natty thing where the Lyle McDonald question came up. And, I was thinking about like, like the integral sign and like the natty being on the bottom of the notation. <laughs> That's right. Natty limit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so here is the deal. We're not saying that you need to uh, have a higher surplus. We're actually not saying that. Force feeding can occur from applying a normal surplus for longer or beyond the point where your body wants to gain weight anymore. 
So if you gain from, usually you gain from 180 to 200 and then you cut back down, okay? Why don't you try getting from 180 to 210, extending the same surplus just for longer? Yeah, well, because from 200 to 210, you're going to feel like shit and you're, you're going to have to force feed because your body's going to get tired of eating all that food. Your surplus is the same. It's only 500 calories or 300 calories, but for that much longer, it's just a huge... James, you ever... I know for a fact, because I used to be your, your coach in this. Remember like a mass phase would end and you're like, I can't wait to stop eating this much food. Oh, yeah. Dude. There have been no recent increases in the amount of food, but like at some point, your body's like, nope, fuck you. Like It just stops trying to eat that much food. It's just like, I can't stand this anymore. Get this out of my face. That's why we always jokingly tell people like uh, massing is, is almost equally, if not this equally stressful as doing cut phases for a lot of people. Because when you get to that force feeding point, not to mention all the training that you're doing, it's awful. Yeah. And you feel like shit all the time. Yeah, 100%. So... Basically, um, you know, the, we're not actually advocating for a higher caloric surplus. We're not advocating faster rates of gain. We're advocating that if you've been to a certain max body weight, maybe it's time to go a little higher and the next time a little higher and the next time a little higher. So instead of ending your cuts, uh, ending your masses at 200 pounds and cutting down to 180, maybe several years after broaching that uh, window, you could be ending your masses at 220. And, and then several years after that, still ending them at 220, but recomping leaner a little each time, you could be holding 15 pounds more muscle than you thought was your natty limit. Um, the way you find your natty limit really is years of highly organized effective training where years of, of uh, progressions into higher body weights, all you net is fat. You don't get any stronger, you don't get any more visible muscle, and you cut back to the same body weight you always were in the same condition you always were. If you have like four or five macro cycles of essentially identical results while pushing the envelope, you're at your natty limit. Congratulations, right? Um, but most people never get there. Most people will just stop at 200 because they're like, oh, I just don't want to get that much fatter. Well, I've gotten that much fatter numerous times during my natty career. And then I would lean out and I was a little heavier. And then I would lean out and I was a little heavier, lean out and I was a little heavier. And pretty soon I was jacked, you know, like 200 or whatever, relatively lean as a natty. And that was really cool. But it didn't get, I get there by force feeding myself, not a ton of calorie. My rates of gain weren't very high. I just masked for longer. I didn't want to mask for longer, right? Exactly when your body's rebelling and telling you, hey, this is too much. That's probably when you keep going. That's probably true for cutting. It's probably true for massing how much weight you put on the bar, how many reps you do, how many sets you do. Your body doesn't really doesn't like to improve. Uh, so sometimes it's a really good idea to push the, the pace. So he says in the science community, everyone says lean bulk is optimal. I agree. I agree. It's probably more optimal to stay a little, a little leaner, but uh, don't push that too far in the other direction. I think a very good voice, I'll stop sharing now because we don't need, I think a very good voice in the community against the extremes of lean bulking lately has been um, Eric Helms, because, you know, there's that whole 10 to 15% body fat window. And Eric's like, look, if you get up to 17, 18, 20%, you're still healthy and you're getting stronger. Like, fucking, you're, you're still getting fucking muscle. Don't, don't be insane. So I think a lot of the people that say, well, I'm lean bulking, they're just fat phobic. That's what I was going to say. God damn it. Sorry. James, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say there's a difference between lean bulking and fat phobia at that point. And the people who really advocate for like the lean bulk are the guys who basically spend 10 years and never actually change their body composition at all. Right. They just pretend mass. They get a little fluffy in the abs. They go immediately back into cutting and never. And I, I think we always, I think women get a lot of like bad press for uh, body image dysmorphia and stuff like that. Men are the worst men. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? Uh, we are the worst when it comes to that stuff. We just don't like to talk about it. So I think, yeah, the fat phobia is really the issue there. And Mike, am I, am I mixing up questions? I thought we were talking about this in the context of recomping. Am I, or is that a different question? We were talking about it in the context of, so Lyle said that you only gain muscle in your first five years or whatever. Right. Okay. And That's, we said yeah. that if you're recomp gaining, yes, that then you're done gaining most muscle within five years. But if you push the limits of your body weight, you can gain for much longer than five years because yeah. pushing your body weight artificially higher by force feeding yourself still at the same rate just for longer uh does in fact add muscle the hypercaloric condition is a very very uh conducive to hypertrophy and there's you know how do i put it another way unfortunately all the all the people that that come come to mind are 
on drugs, but it doesn't change drugs or not drugs. Um, uh, like somebody like Brian Shaw, somebody like Derek Poundstone, who's a strong man, you know, somebody like Ronnie Poundstone Coleman, shake it. innovator. That's right. Um, Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler, et cetera. Drugs, not drugs. It works the same way. Jay Cutler didn't get to 290 pounds in his off season with abs and veins by simply taking a lot of drugs and training hard and eating sort of just whatever to stay at a clean bulk. Jay Cutler ate so much fucking food that he was asked, and this is on, on YouTube. This video is on YouTube. You could check it out any time. He's driving in his car and they ask him, what do you think about like cheat meals and stuff like that? He's like, I can't relate at all because if I had a cheat meal opportunity, which I don't, I would choose to eat nothing. I would just skip a meal. I'm <laughs> so fucking tired of eating. I eat 5,000 calories on my cutting phase. Like I eat 7,000 plus on my mass phase. I can't stand it anymore. Like that is a person who is pushing boundaries. That is not because some, because literally there's a way of taking drugs and training that because, you know, drugs make you hungrier and they make you gain weight. They're anabolic for a reason. Some people just take drugs and eat and then they just grow. And they say, yeah, I got a lot of this test cycle. It really helped me put on muscle, but it didn't help me put on a lot of weight. Like you dumb asshole. You, the weight is up to you. The drugs facilitate that. And sometimes they help it in a roundabout way, but you can also just force feed yourself. And there's, if you have never pushed your appetite regulation beyond the point of comfort, you can't say you've tried to gain muscle in a, in a, a real well thought out attempt, period. Totally agree. And then just to spin it back to the question in the context. So what we were talking about was to get to the question was people don't actually reach their natty limit when they don't break the boundaries of their comfort and their comfort zone. Right. So that was kind of the idea was um, in order to actually hit your natty limit, you have to actually do force feeding. If people are left to their own devices, they will never actually reach their natty limit just because it's so uncomfortable to get up to that level. So I think that's maybe where the confusion might be lying. So yep. uh, it's, yeah, force feeding is necessary even to get to that natural limit. And then certainly with performance enhancing drugs too. Yep. Boom. I think that's it. That's it. All right. Uh, are we going to be on for Tuesday next week? Normal time? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then I'm going to actually see you on Sunday, right? The day of the sun. That's right. I'm excited. Did you see my Instagram post uh, that I got from my brother-in-law? The I don't sun know. God, the sun God. Don't, oh my God, can you please check Instagram real quick? It's like the third thing on my Instagram. All right, let's see. Remember the Aztec sacrifices to the sun gods or whatever? It's an artistic yeah, depiction. I, I see the, the, uh, the Yoda one right now. Uh -huh. God damn it, just go on Mike's page. There we go. Is it a story or is it uh, like a post? Oh, wait, there it is. It's a post. Oh, Look yeah. at the facial expressions. <laughs> <laughs> He's oh, like, oh, you guys, you should. Guys, you should stop, stop giving me your hearts. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. Even the, even the guy whose heart it is is like, mm. <laughs> so creepy. That would be sweet if they did like a like a children's history of the Americas and that was in it. <laughs> oh God, I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> I've been I've been like so deep into like the like audiobooks lately especially like the really unpleasant ones like the douglas murray like stuff where it's just like oh i don't want to think Doug about douglas murray yeah i love him i could listen to him forever did you did you ever listen to the strange death of europe i haven't but i've seen about three trillion podcasts about that and i've listened about trillion podcasts about his latest book the madness of crowds which i can't wait to read i, I listened to both the madness was really good i just finished the strange death uh, at first, you kind of it kind of comes off as like this guy just seems like a like a pissed off like white guy, um, yeah. but then he gets into all the statistics and stuff, and you're like, mm -hmm. this is crazy. Yeah. It's it's yeah. definitely a tough pill to swallow. I can I can sympathize yeah. for people who didn't like it, uh, but it's interesting. One hundred percent, man. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's wrap this one up, and then uh, I'll actually see you this week, which will be sweet, and I'll keep working on the hypertrophy book in the meantime, and we'll keep cool. I think we're still recording, right? Yeah. All so right. we'll let's stop recording. Peace, <laughs> <folks>. <laughs> Peace folks. See you tomorrow or yeah. next time.